You're listening to the Rewilding Earth Podcast. Noss has put in over 30 years of work in developing the ideas of conservation biology and has become an important figure in conservation planning and management as well as his work promoting naturalist education. Noss has been the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Conservation Biology and president of the Society of Conservation Biology. He is president and chief scientist for the Florida Institute for Conservation Science, chief science advisor for the Southwestern Grasslands Initiative, and an editor for the Journal of Natural History, Education, and Experience. Reed's published work consists of over 315 published or in-press scientific articles and eight published books, with two more books in preparation. By the late 90s, he was collaborating with conservation biologist Michael Soule to refine the conservation idea of rewilding. According to their paper, Rewilding and Biodiversity, Complementary Goals for Continental Conservation, Sule and Noss identified the driving factors of rewilding as cores, corridors, and carnivores. I recently talked with Reed about his work as it pertains to wilderness recovery networks and the origin and history of rewilding, as well as his concerns about conservation policy and his vision of where we might go from here. 20 years ago or so, Dave Foreman uh, took me under his wing and was showing me the ropes. And one of the books that he handed me as he was broadening my education, he handed me your, your book, Saving Nature's Legacy, Protecting and Restoring Biodiversity. And Dave said, read this and get back to me. <laughs> and he, and, and he's, he was always doing that. He was slipping me books. He knew I had a long way to go to get caught up with what was, what was going on, what was important. And so that's where I first found out about Reed Noss. And I'm very, very excited to be talking to you today, Reed. Thank you so much for taking the time. What do you mean today or what did you mean back then when you guys were talking about rewilding? What does it mean to you? To step back just a little bit. You know, as you, I'm sure, know from Dave Foreman and others, I was involved with the Earth First movement and the Earth First Journal um, throughout most of the 80s up until 1990 when the big split occurred, the, the coup, and the journal was seized by others. But I, um, in the 80s, I was using the term wilderness recovery for what I now, and many people maybe use the word rewilding for the same concept. And to be honest, I was trying to search my brain prior to this call to think of whether I actually coined the term wilderness recovery, or if it's another thing that maybe Dave coined and I borrowed. But I wrote an article in 1985 for the Earth First Journal called um, Wilderness Recovery Plan for Florida, which was basically it's actually cited, and there's a, um, a figure of an interconnected reserve network for Florida in Saving Nature's Legacy. So if you look in Saving Nature's Legacy, back in the literature cited, you'll see NOS 1985, Earth First Journal, um, a wilderness recovery plan for, for Florida. And I was using wilderness recovery as a way to restore wilderness qualities, and in particular, in the case of Florida, to restore populations of Florida panther, and Florida black bear throughout the state and ultimately beyond. So I was using wilderness recovery in that sense. Later then, um, Dave coined the term rewilding in one of his around the campfire. I think it was one of his around the campfire. He can set you straight on this around the campfire articles in wild earth. And that was mid nineties or so. See, the way, the way I think of it, because I, I always fantasize that I might write something up like this in a, for a screenplay adapt, adaptation for TV or something, and you and Sule and Foreman were all in a room, and uh, the, the Secretary of the Interior and his thugs were beating on the door, and you were kind of trying to come up with a plan, and I know that's not how it happened, <laughs> and you're, you're elucidating that for us right now. It's like, uh, but it's always exciting because that's the way a lot of people, the historians, the people who are really interested in this stuff and really want to hear about this. It, it's nostalgia partly um, for a better time because even though we were all going through some really seriously bad attacks on nature in general back then, with the perspective we have today, it almost seems quaint. 
Yes. And so when I started using the word rewilding, it was based on Dave's usage. But to me, it was just an, a shorthand for the wilderness recovery terminology that I had used, you know, 10 years earlier and a few others. So, you know, I'm not trying to claim priority or anything. Yeah. It's not convergence things. And, but really, I think the whole concept of rewilding really emerged out of the Earth First movement prior to the Wildlands Project. And then that was incorporated into the Wildlands Project and then got this new name of, of rewilding. Has your idea of rewilding changed over the years? Like what would your definition be? How would it be different than when you were talking about wilderness recovery and your very first plan in Florida for the black bear and puma? Well, that's a good question. At the time that I had my wilderness recovery plan for Florida, when I construed that, it was primarily based on large carnivores, bear and panther. But a secondary theme was restoration of natural disturbance regimes, especially fire, which is extremely important in many ecosystems, of course, across North America and the world. But frequent fire is more important in Florida and the lower coastal plain of North America than virtually anywhere in the world. And over the years, my appreciation of that has increased. And in fact, just a few months ago, I had my most recent book come out, which is Fire Ecology of Florida and the Southeastern Coastal Plain. And so even though um, Michael Sule and I emphasized, you know, the, the three C's, cores, connectivity, and carnivores, uh, in our 1998 article, um, even at that time, I was actually trying to persuade Michael to put more in there about natural disturbance regimes. It is mentioned, as I recall, but as I define rewilding now, it's restoration of complete food webs and natural disturbance regimes. To me, it's, it's not just about carnivores. It's about complete food webs with all the major missing pieces restored, as well as the processes with em emphasis on natural disturbances, which have been horribly compromised through fragmentation and through direct fire suppression and many other and agency man, land management and so on. Right. Uh, the, the conversation going on uh, in the States right now and, and every year, and it seems to be getting more intense it, and the fires are starting earlier. People have a general idea of fires, fire bad, you know, like uh, Frankenstein bad. They don't, and they just, there's no conversation going on about natural disturbance regimes, like where fire is natural, where it is desired, where it is the, the, the discussion in, in the uh, general sense is around how can we suppress this? How can we save these people's homes who've built in the middle of uh, places that shouldn't be built in? And, uh, and that's really a, a downer, right? I mean, we've always had to kind of knowing what you know and then watching what the general discourse is out there, despite the efforts of groups like Rewilding and Wildlands Network and everybody else, do you ever get to have this conversation in a, in a sense where you feel like it's reaching a broader audience than us um, conservation geeks? Not very often. I mean, it's really been a mission of mine. I, mean, I think definitely the students in my classes, I think, <laughs> gain some understanding of the importance of all this. But Otherwise, speaking to the general public, I, I feel I usually don't get too far. I mean, I do give talks to, to like local native plant society chapters and local Ottoman chapters. And so I hammer on those themes there, but I, I'm really not sure how many people really get it. Yeah. Um, there's some heads nodding, which make me think a few do, but generally outside of, you know, diehard conservationists and um, ecologist, scientific ecologist, um, there's not a whole lot of people that appreciate either natural disturbances or large carnivores and their importance in ecosystems. You know, reading your book, um, you'd have to be a little bit of a geek. You'd have to really kind of have a little bit more than a passing interest in the topic um, to really get into it and understand it and enjoy yeah the whole thing because it, it can get technical. And so I, I watched as people, you know, Dave and, and others were starting to advocate, let's really just, let's focus from a public relations standpoint on something that we think, we guess that people could understand and get behind easier. And I think that's where the carnivore thing came so that people 
could understand it. And then if we got them that far, then we could bring them into that deeper, the deeper issues, the more complex uh, topics. Sure. But here we are, it's 2018, and we still have the same problem. We still feel the same way uh, that we did back then in terms of how this is cutting through, which I don't feel it is very much at all, to, um, through all of the noise that's out there. So I'm on a constant mission to try to figure out what it's going to take other than just huge, huge disaster. Um, but the thing is, disasters are happening and people aren't turning around and saying, I want to hear from the experts on this. You think that you would, your phone would be ringing off the hook. The, the level of public um, understanding of science and respect for scientific knowledge is at maybe a historically all-time low. Um, you'd think these things would improve over time, but it's, it's been way beyond my historical knowledge since there's been such rampant anti-intellectualism. Dave has written a little bit about this, mm. but... I mean, people just don't believe scientists anymore. They think, you know, that we're just making this shit up mm-hmm. to, in order to get grants and be on the public dole. I mean, that's, I see people saying that. And this is, um, you, you know, it's not just the hardcore Trumpers. It's, it's virtually the entire Republican Party and a, and a good part of the Democratic Party. It's just, I don't get it. I don't know how this happened because as recently as the late 90s, I remember a poll because I cited in, in my 1997 book showing that the public had more respect for scientists than any other demographic group that they ask about. So more respect for scientists than they had for politicians, for the press, et cetera, et cetera. Scientists were right up there at the top. And I don't think that's true anymore. And I think that's what the big impetus was for for starting uh, something up and to really investigating what everybody thinks now, what everybody feels might be the next best step to take in order to, or set of steps or a plan to to move forward. We already know a lot about what doesn't work because a lot hasn't worked and we have the data on that. <laughs> and so something else needs to happen and I'm hopeful still. And that's really the message of rewilding now is that there's, there's you know, despite all of this, even despite all of this, we can't, our message is basically we can't just sit down and, and uh, you know, fold our cards. We have to keep pushing. So that's what this is about. But yeah, that's one thing I really like about the, um, the fact that rewilding has despite the fact that you used in many different ways, uh, at least it remains an optimistic message. And it's something that now quite a few people have heard about. From your perspective, in Florida, principally the East Coast, what kinds of things have you seen that you're really proud of, that you've been a part of, that you've helped to uh, bring along that um, would be considered rewilding, rewilding or uh, wilderness recovery successes? Well, there were successes at least for a while. Um, <laughs> The um, that 1985 paper I mentioned, the Wilderness Recovery Plan for Florida, included a map that was hand-drawn. I later had an artist redo it that showed an interconnected network of protected lands and corridors and buffer zones across the state. And that then became um, a major theme of the Florida Earth First Group that I more or less led along with several others. And we had a pretty good following, several hundred people. We put out a monthly newsletter. Um, we were really pretty active. We had meetings, you know, in my front yard on a regular basis. So it was pretty cool. That was in the 80s. Um, and when we developed then, I, I was working with help of a couple of colleagues on this big wall size map with mylar overlays to make a more detailed proposal for a connected network of conservation areas in Florida. And we had a a conference. I didn't organize it, but it was organized by another group that was around at the time called the um, Environmental Information Center, which no longer exists. But anyway, we had a corridor conference and we even had, we had our, then the map that I was just talking about, the big wall sized map with the mylar overlays, overlays hanging from the podium. And there were, Hundreds of people at this conference. We had a, a guy running for governor who gave a talk and endorsed this proposal. Hmm. And the things were really exciting. And the, the map then showed up um, on the front page of many of the newspapers uh, statewide. And 
my advisor, I was a grad student at the time, my advisor, who was one of my inspirations for a lot of this, Larry Harris, um, he was like pissed at me because he goes, now we're going to have all this backlash. You know, you're going to scare people. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, there was very little backlash. We got a little bit from the Farm Bureau who claimed that these corridors would spread disease from wildlife to livestock, which was complete bullshit. <laughs> said, Look, we're not creating new corridors. We're just trying to maintain, protect what's already there or restore those that have been relatively recently lost. So that actually worked, that retort worked pretty well. And within just a couple years, and actually I have this in Saving Nature's Legacy, I have a map that was produced by a workshop of the Nature Conservancy, Florida Audubon, both very mainstream conservative organizations, working with state agencies to basically update my old map. And that was used as the basis for a land acquisition program called Preservation 2000, P2000 for short, which um, was a or $3 billion program over 10 years. So $300 million per year for land acquisition. And this was supplemented by various county bond measures. So altogether, it was up to around half um, um, a billion dollars a year, $500 million a year for land acquisition in Florida to complete this network. So I was extremely optimistic, as were most conservationists in the state who had worked on this, and that after the first 10-year program, a new um, $3 billion program was established. And all this died just about seven years ago when our latest governor came into office, Rick Scott, who's now running for Senate. He Somehow he got reelected, the son of a bitch. But um, <laughs> he's not, he, so he basically killed the program. Legislature really wasn't ever very much in favor of it, but the governors um, of both parties, these were mostly Republican governors, as well as some preceding Democrat governors who endorsed this. So it was a bipartisan thing, which is a real surprising <laughs> that anything could be bipartisan these days. But yeah. Both of these big land acquisition programs were bipartisan in Florida, supported wholeheartedly by Republican governors like Jeb Bush. And then all that died. So even though it, all this was very encouraging and it was rewilding on a massive scale, it all ended about seven years ago when the current governor took office. So I can't be so optimistic anymore. And actually many of the lands that were protected under that program, the same governor has proposed opening up to massive uh, tourist development, to logging, to increased livestock grazing, I mean, you name it. So even those areas that were protected under these programs are now being lost, many of them. So it's, it's pretty depressing down here. So for many years, I was very optimistic and encouraged, but um, for the last few, it's just been de- depressing as hell. It's rough. But I would like to, when you're talking about Mylar and maps and everything, I mean, it's so cool after all these years to connect, to come full circle, because we did the same thing with Sky Island Alliance, which yeah. I came, became the executive director of for a few That's years. I first heard of you, right, through Sky Island work. And we had the Mylar. We, what you're describing is, is where that came from. Like, I was doing all of that mapping, and what I got a thrill out of the stink we knew it was going to create. We knew people were going to freak out. We're in New Mexico, uh, southern Arizona, and incorporating northern Sonora and Chihuahua into the, this big Sky Islands map. And we knew everybody we were going to piss off. And that gave me a thrill. There were people in the room that were like, oh, man, I don't know. This is, but I'm like, it's time to piss people off. People need to become pissed off. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But we need to ask for what we really know is right and stop beating around the bush like every other conservation organization out there was already doing that just fine, you know, with uh, staying away from population issues and staying away from any of the hot button stuff. And I was just thrilled to be in the thick of it. And the way you described the maps and everything else, it just brought all of that back. And, you know, yours, yours happened a lot earlier than ours. And now I'm starting to get a sense of where all that came from. The other thing that I want to bring up is while it is depressing as hell right now, uh, people need to hear the story you just told. 
that it is possible that, I mean, people are starting to forget history is somewhat being or greatly being rewritten to the extent that I think people would be very surprised to hear about billions of dollars, 300 million a year, uh, and then a program like that getting renewed in, for another decade, even though it got squashed. Uh, people need to know that that ever could have ever been possible. If it was possible, it can be possible again because you gave the key to why it's no longer and it's completely about politics. America is learning a really, really big lesson right now. The biggest lesson since this country was founded that it's really, really important to vote. And now we're getting the examples of what can happen when we, when we let the wrong people get the kind of power that your governor and all over the country, this is happening everywhere, all the way up to the top. It's being led from the top now. Um, I think it's important that people, we have to learn the lesson. I'm hoping we're learning it. And then we also need to know that people like you and the programs that you help to, uh, on the scale that you helped to put together and, and push forward and actually got going, were, were ever even possible. Because I think people are starting to lose sight of the fact that it was ever better, you know, or what, what that even meant. What was it when we had a success that, and that means that it could be possible in the future. We just have to move some people around, uh, get some people unelected and get the right people in. And, and that's what gives me hope. I, I mean, does that help uh, with you when you're thinking about, this is a temporary thing. This administration as all in administrations are governorships and everything can be temporary. They don't have to be legacies. We can turn things around. Does that give you some hope? It, it does. And I, I was just reminded as I was listening here that um, there is one project I developed prior to coming to Florida along the same lines. I worked for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources for their state parks and then their state natural areas program in the early 80s. And in 1982 and early 83, um, my boss there gave me an unusual assignment. He said, Reed, I want you to figure out what we're missing in conservation in Ohio. And I had already been spouting off about this, that we were focused on these little small natural areas, these climatic relics, like little bogs left over from the Pleistocene and so on, which were really cool places, but there were no large scale land conservation efforts, nothing that would restore a whole ecosystem and where we could reintroduce bears and ultimately gray wolves and so on. So I came up with a proposal for that, very much like the one I did in Florida, but just for Southern Ohio, which is the kind of the Appalachian part of Ohio. And my boss himself loved it, but the higher ups in the department were pissed that I'd been wasting my salary money for months coming out with this, you know, unrealistic, audacious, ridiculous proposal. And the reaction was so bad that I quit my job and moved to Florida. But the good thing is the Nature Conservancy of all organizations in Ohio really liked the proposal, especially because I noted that the first priority where the first efforts for connection should be was this network of preserves called the Edge of Appalachia Preserve System in Southern Ohio that the Nature Conservancy had developed along with the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History. And I had proposed the first major linkage be, be, to, to get bring those reserves that were isolated at the time together through corridors and link them to the east to a, a designated state wilderness area of a state forest called Shawnee State Forest. And amazingly, that has been a success. And the Nature Conservancy, there's a guy there that about once a year sends me a map of what their acquisitions have been. And they now have, I mean, it's small scale, but for Ohio, it's big. They have about 60,000 acres of preserves with a complete linkage between all the reserves and all the way over to this state wilderness area. Wow. So that's been a success and it continues to be. They're still buying more land. And around what year was that? That was 1982 and 83. Could that possibly be one of the first uh, projects of its kind? Could that be where corridors and, and, and things really got, you know, put on the ground? And, and I think it might be, actually. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I never heard that story. I'd never, I didn't know it went back that far. 
that's incredible. Another example then of, you know, uh, in the right climate, not even in the right climate, because back then you wouldn't have said it was the right. In fact, you described it as the wrong climate when you were doing it. And that was going to make people mad. And it did make, but it still went through. So I really, I think that is a, the, the message of hope in all of this is that it, it doesn't have to be, you know, absolutely perfect in, in terms of a political environment or um, the stakeholders don't have to all be completely unanimously in agreement for things like this. They never will. They never have been anyway, but for things like this to happen. And I love that. I tried to get, especially when I was getting hammered by my bosses before I quit, I was trying to get support for this from the Sierra Club from Friends of the Earth, from the Audubon chapter in Ohio and other environmental groups, they wanted nothing to do with it. They thought it was totally unrealistic and I couldn't get any support. The only group that was interested was the one I mentioned, the Nature Conservancy of all people. And in this particular case, I'm not saying it's going to be like this everywhere, but in that particular case, I think it's been successful because the Nature Conservancy's approach of quietly buying land under the radar not publicizing it at all is actually been successful. The only place they publicize it is in like the Nature Conservancy magazine and the state newsletter and so on. They have not made any political statements about this. It's all just been buying land. What, what the Nature Conservancy used to do, which they've largely quit doing, they're fortunately still doing to some extent in Ohio to put together this network. Yeah, and so locally or regionally, a legacy can continue on that might not match what national is doing policy-wise in a group like Nature Conservancy. And that's really good news, too, that whether it's real on-purpose autonomy or just people are doing something on the ground the way they see it ought to be. And the people on the ground are the ones. They know this, the areas. They know what's important more than... Uh, you know, people on the national board of, of uh, organizations as big as the Nature Conservancy. That's really good news, too, that it, somebody there is really keeping that legacy alive. I was thinking in terms of making a stink and pissing people off and being willing to take the risk and how much attention the Sky Island plan got, how much attention your things got because they were audacious, they were bold. And everybody else was just milk toast. Everybody else was just trying to please all the politicians and, and everything else and come to compromises. And I've always been on that side of, I've always been attracted more to that side of things. I mean, Earth First, I've heard Dave talk about it in terms of Earth First made Sierra Club look reasonable. Yeah. And, and if it wasn't for Earth First pulling so, so hard... Uh, being called radicals and everything else, nobody would have sat down at the table with Sierra Club when it came to really big negotiations over new wilderness areas and protections and things. And I think that these plans, these connectivity things are are really a big deal too. Maps scare the crap out of the wrong people. I mean, they really scare. And Dave gave us a big lesson about that. He said, when this map, as soon as we map something, they freak out. And he was right. They do. Ranchers and and uh, stakeholders just absolutely lose their minds. And we thought, some people in the room thought that was a negative. We don't want them losing their minds, but it actually turned out in our case to work really well because they were losing their minds and nobody cared about us, but everybody wanted to know why the rancher's hair was on fire. So they asked them and then our story got out that the map traveled through their outrage and got a little bit of publicity, a lot more than we would have gotten in, in any other way. Um, just through their through the controversy of the whole thing. So now we have this new thing that that we want to talk a lot more about that E.O. Wilson has put out um, called Half Earth, this idea of Half Earth. And, and it, nothing to me in the last decade could be more radical than just telling everybody we need to protect half the earth for nature, for biodiversity, for its own sake, but also for the furtherance of human uh, uh, civilization and everything else. I mean, that's just saying that knowing coming from that place where when you put something on a map, landowners are going to lose their minds. I don't think of anything's going to drive them more crazy than saying now what we are really saying that we really need is half the earth. What do you think about the whole half earth thing? Does it, does it, does it get that for you? And starting in 1992, that's exactly what we were saying in the wildlands project. And if you read the very first, well, the, the theme issue on the Wildlands Project, 1992 Wild Earth Magazine, 
um, I wrote the article on what on wildlands project land conservation strategy. And I reviewed the literature and then I just, some of this I reviewed again in Saving Nature's Legacy um, in more detail and then later in a book chapter to come up with that, that same conclusion that most studies are suggesting that in order to meet well-established goals of conservation biology, we have to protect an average of 50% of each region and, and the earth as a whole, in a range of anywhere from 25 to 75% of a region on a regional scale, depending on the attributes of that region. And then actually while doing that research, and this is, I cited this in my Wild Earth um, article, I uncovered a paper by the, the Odom brothers, the very famous ecologists Gene and Tom mm-hmm. Odom, published in 1972, 20 years before my article, who did a study of South Florida and determined that using what we now call an ecosystem services argument, they use an ecosystem model to say in order to sustain these services that humans um, persist on, we need to protect half of South Florida as natural area. And then they went further and said, until these specific studies can be done for other regions, we suggest that environmental planners plan to protect at least 50% of every region. So this argument goes back to 72. A long I was, way back. Ed Wilson is saying that this, that's a good thing. Maybe that kind of maybe proves the theory that people are ready for a radical something now that they weren't before because some attention has been captured. Like people's imaginations have been stoked by this. And uh, John Davis, the executive director of Rewilding, really very much wants to talk uh, more about this idea and really bring up this issue because it's it's just to break through that ice that people have in their veins toward uh, conservation issues nowadays. They're really interested in a lot of other things, um, and uh, they only get interested maybe in things that are so outlandish. So maybe now is the time, despite all of the the historical record showing that half Earth has been a discussion for quite a long time. It has, and you know I think it would be good for the Rewilding Institute to. Um, partner in some way with the Nature Needs Half organization, which is a project of the Wild Foundation, so Harvey Locke. Their their whole goal is to get half the earth protected. So they're kind of working towards the same thing as Wilson's <laughs> foundation. Well, it's been proven that having uh, two isolated groups or more working on a project from different angles and everything, you're going to get to a solution a lot quicker than having one one view. What excites me about that is if maps piss people off on a local or regional level, a global map is really going to be the Uber of all. (laughs) Uh, I mean, that's going to start the biggest discussion. It it, it, it seems it would scale to that. If you're going to have a map of the earth eventually where everything really needs to be protected, it's all laid out in much the same way, hopefully, uh, in the way that we were doing the small reserves, relatively small uh, areas, way back when when you started it, and as we continued with uh, Wildlands Network and Sky Island and and all the others, Yellowstone, and Yukon, all those guys, uh, all of that goes into a great big giant map. Who could we piss off then? <laughs> That's right. But you know, again, the 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 surprising thing about our Florida project is that even though my PhD advisor. Um, he knew I was working on this, and he did not want me to release this at this corridors conference I mentioned because he feared this massive backlash that we'd piss off everybody. And surprisingly, it didn't piss off many people, and it, it inspired a lot more people than it than it pissed off. And I mentioned the only negativity we got really was from the Florida Farm Bureau. The other groups that you would expect to be really up in arms about it, like the um, Florida. Um, what do they call themselves? Livestock Growers Association and Home Builders Association, and so on. They were they were silent on it. Well, nothing will humble a crowd of people like a good hurricane uh, that's coming with a lot more frequency every year. Some wildfires that are completely out of the norm and uh, ice caps melting. I think I think humanity is becoming a lot more humble, and I think people who are a lot more dug in in the past are finding themselves a lot more open than even they ever thought they would be. It probably surprises them just as much. From your perspective, what, what, would you, what ways would you like to see people getting involved? As a result of listening to this today, listening to your message, listening to the history and everything, somebody's really fired up 
well, how would you like to see them get involved um, if they're a scientist that doesn't consider themselves a conservation biologist or an activist or a writer or a grassroots person who just supports the organizations that are doing this work? What, what, what would you like to see them doing more of? But well, one fundamental principle, I think, is that everybody has a role to play, but those will collectively be many different roles. I mean, there are people that are well suited to just educating, um, educating kids, educating the public in their local area or maybe at a broader scale. There's other people who can contribute the most to conservation by being activists, you know, supporting direct action and other um, means. There's others who provide inspiration through their writings and their speeches, people like Dave Foreman. And then there's others like the path I chose who can, and it's the reason that I went on to pursue graduate degrees in ecology is that I figured this is a way that I could get the knowledge and I must admit the credibility to be taken seriously enough that I could help influence conservation decisions. But everybody has a different role. And I think everybody needs to find, if they're interested in conservation, if they have those values, which I think still a lot of people do, uh, even though I think there's a lot of cognitive dissonance out there, I'm amazed. I see people that have conservation-oriented bumper sticker right next to a Trump bumper sticker. <laughs> what does that mean, you know? It's insane. <laughs> they're insane, right? But, or else just dumb as hell. But the point is, there are a lot of people that do have some interest in conservation, and they just need to find out with their talents and their skills where they can best contribute and how they can best contribute. Reed, thank you so, so much for uh, being on one of the, one of the very first uh, rewilding podcasts on this very important topic. Um, and I really, really want to talk to you again in the future. I know that our listeners will too. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for listening to the Rewilding Earth podcast. Be sure to visit rewilding.org to subscribe so you don't miss past and future episodes. And while you're there, please consider supporting Rewilding by making a donation or subscribing to the Rewilding Earth newsletter.